I'm going to start off by saying uh, I had to skip out of class in order to be here, so now you're in my classroom. Um, all right, thank you very much. So I've got two talks that I'm actually going to be giving. So uh, the first one, I flipped the order. One was going to be about the tiny ML education aspects and what we've actually been doing in terms of outreach, in terms of educating people. You folks are all very excited about, you know, the consumer market and so forth. My market is basically the students and the population of, you know, students across the world. So in tiny ML education, which I'll talk about in much more detail later, um, you know, we'll effectively summarize what the tiny ML foundation and many other groups have been working together behind the scenes in order to educate the next group. You're all talking about what's a killer application. I'll say I don't know what it is, but I guarantee you one of those thousands of people who are doing the tiny ML courses are the ones who are going to actually shape that future for us. So I wouldn't worry about what's here now. I'd say a couple of years down the road, we should really be looking at the next generation of students. But more on that soon. Uh, so today, what I'm actually really excited to talk about is really um, how we should be thinking about building machine learning into embedded devices. By and large, whenever we're talking about it, I bet you that every single one of us is kind of thinking about, oh, what's the model, what's the parameter size, and all these good nitty-gritty details about building AI models into embedded devices. I think that's a very old-school mi mi mindset, and I think we've got to depart from that mindset to really be able to unlock what the potential capabilities of TinyML really are, and that's what I'm actually going to be talking about today. So it goes without saying that we're all excited about machine learning and it's all over the place, right? The biggest reason that we're all obviously here is because increasingly we're seeing that machine learning capabilities are increasingly penetrating into our homes and our everyday consumer devices. As Alessandro mentioned, one of my favorite application areas is in fact medical applications. That's an area that I really think has really high value that makes a lot of sense to actually put the effort in there because the premiums are large, the value add of keeping data local is extremely valuable, right? So that's just my personal belief. Now, as we start building all these things, right, we're obviously very excited because there's a wealth of data that we haven't yet tapped into, right? We were talking about data just earlier. I'd say that, you know, whatever machine learning capabilities we've seen today is largely looking at a very tiny fraction of that big data that we have collected over the past several years, right? Really, what we're talking about is unlocking a lot of the unstructured data that's actually around the world. And for that, we are nowhere capable in terms of the cloud infrastructure capabilities that we have. Right? So everything is really going to be, have to be at the endpoint, which is very exciting. But this also presents us with a really fundamental sort of a problem in terms of how we're trying to think about these systems today. You know, some of the concerns that were raised were around like, you know, how the end user or the customer is kind of looking at this little widget that you're talking about and saying that, hey, this has got some incredible intelligence capabilities for, let's say, computer vision, where you have a physical sensor, you've got some microcontroller that has got some ML model that you stuck onto it, and then effectively that's going to be doing processing. The average consumer often does worry about, you know, what aspects of the data are likely to leak out. We today have no official or hard guarantee mechanisms or standardized ways of thinking about what data actually sits locally and what data you can actually guarantee concretely that your is not leaking out, right? This fundamental model is kind of like the way we are thinking about things as we deploy ML today, and that's what I'm going to call roughly sensor 1.0 so I can kind of compare and contrast down the road later. But this leads into a whole set of questions. The developer questions, for instance, you know, when you're building these machine learning sensors, how can you make guarantees about what the code is? The ML model is just one piece of the puzzle, right? We all talk about ML, but in reality, we know that it's just a smart little widget as part of an application pipeline, even on that microcontroller. That means you've got pre-processing going on, you've got some post-processing going on, and you've got that whole application that's trying to make sense of some decision or some outcome that's come out of the machine learning model. But that means that now when you start injecting code in there, questions come up about, hmm, how, what other data is this thing actually accessing, right? For instance, I'll tell you firsthand, we're trying to build a smart lab at Harvard, right? Where effectively we take the dorms, we convert the dorms into fully instrumented devices because the students want to understand, you know, how they're consuming resources in the dorms. The lawyers freak out at Harvard with this idea. Why? Because I'm like, hey, we've got a tiny little widget. We've custom built these sensors, you know, it's got a camera, but it's not really looking at people's faces. It's just looking at counting as to, is there a person or not a person? They're like, we don't care. You got a camera on that thing, right? So it fundamentally stops the ability to kind of make concrete, you know, being able to convince people that, look, just because it's got a camera does not mean information is actually leaking out. It's very hard to concretely define this for people. That's just one of the consumes, uh, one of the concerns around just the data that's kind of like, you know, what data is actually leaking out, right? You take an image, you have to process that image. Well, is that image also potentially going to leak out? That's one. 
Developers often worry about, like, okay, well, how do I know that the code that I've written, you know, is something that is isolated from the rest of the machine learning model code? You want the machine learning model to only see certain things that don't, you know, get mixed in with the rest of it. So there are many, many questions that kind of start creeping up in this traditional paradigm of how we tend to think about machine learning sensors today. Undoubtedly, this is why when you look online, as much as we all love to talk about how awesome TinyML is and how, you know, there's a mass market down there, you also have concerns when you start looking up, you know, the flip side. You get what you search for. So if you actually search carefully enough about like TinyML and concerns, then you get a whole bunch of different search articles on the web today where people are concerned about, is my TV actually you know, listening to me or watching? How many times have you had you know, this experience where you're having a conversation with somebody, right? you say something, and then you want to like Google it or whatever, Bing it, uh, and you go to your phone and you start looking at it, and it's like, how did it know so precisely that that's the intent that you're, you actually had? It's creepy, but I've definitely personally experienced that, right? So people do worry about, are these devices that we're carrying around us, like our phones, for instance, are already kind of, you know, quote unquote, spying on us, right? There are plenty of articles around this. This is where I think it really becomes a critical question to think about how we actually think about building these ML capabilities, you know, for these sensor technologies. And I'm gonna talk about not necessarily the nitty gritty implementation details. I think that's very easy. We're all very good engineers. We know how to engineer those kinds of systems. What I wanna talk about how, is how we should approach this at a, at a meta level in terms of packaging things up. So the interesting question that I'm gonna ask is how do we architect future tiny amount sensors because it's all about processing sensor data. How do we do that efficiently? In other words, like, you know, obviously it has to work you know, well. Effectively, in other words, it has to integrate into the existing ecosystem. No one wants a solution that's like, oh, trust me, you have to redo your whole infrastructure, but if you do this, you will save millions of dollars. Yeah, no one's going to ever care about that. And then how do you do this robustly? Meaning, like, you know, how can you make guarantees about what you have? There has to be some sort of transparency in the ecosystem. Now, I'll slice and dice these things as I go forward. So this is where we get into this definition of a machine learning sensor, simply to kind of separate the paradigm shift that I'm talking about from sensor 1.0. It's, uh, a machine learning sensor, an ML sensor, is a self-contained system that utilizes on-device machine learning to extract some useful information by observing some complex phenomena in the real world and then reports it through a simple interface. There's no rocket science in this definition. It's a very layperson sort of a definition. And I want to explain why we need to be thinking about it this way. So here's a, you know, here's a machine learning sensor, right? So Pete Warden, a good colleague of mine, who many of you probably know, they, his company, Useful Sensors, has been building this person sensor. We've been building many variants like this in my lab as well, where it's basically detecting person, you know, detecting whether it's spotted a person using the small little camera and then reporting some output, right? So that's an example of a machine learning sensor. Now, the idea of this machine learning sensor is that it's a fully integrated system, right? Like that you have some sort of sensing capability. The sensing capability is the hardware, might be the physical camera or whatever sensor. And then you have a smart middle of microcontroller that's running a machine learning model. So that fusion between the hardware and the software is effectively the new version of the sensors that we're actually getting into. And the intent is that you want to do this processing, but you want to keep this processing so that whenever you're talking about running the model and actually extracting information from it, you're doing it in a way that you have hardware-wise guaranteed that the information cannot leak out. In other words, logically, if you kind of think about it, an image comes in, I do an inference on it, and the only thing that can get reported on the outside side of the network is whether there was a person, one, or a zero, there's no person, right? So think of it as a very simple binary interface, and that's all you actually get access to within the microcontroller. And the intent is that like, even on an embedded system, Whatever you're running, that quote unquote model is separate physically on an embedded system, right? Like on the, on the microcontroller side. And then you would have your application processor logic, another microcontroller that is you know, effectively ingesting whatever data, uh, whatever filtered data that the ML model is actually generating out. And this is the sensor 2.0 paradigm that I'm going to refer to, right? So effectively, on one hand, your, mo your ML model is effectively encoupled very tightly into the rest of the ML stack, into the rest of the application stack on the existing microcontroller. In the other one, there's some sort of either physical or logical sort of separation that you have between the two in order to be able to get, make guarantees. And there's a lot more that I'm going to slice and dice just on the left-hand side, that ML sensor definition. Now, when you start building about these things this way, then you have to start thinking about what are the guiding principles by which we will have this concept of an ML sensor for the ecosystem. Now, we have identified five different guiding principles, and the rest of the talk is going to step through each and every single one of them, explaining why I think it's important and what's the critical thing. The first and foremost thing, which I think is a very simple thing, is we've got to raise the level of abstraction 
to be able to scalably deploy these machine learning sensors into the existing ecosystem. Today, when we talk about machine learning models getting deployed in these systems, we talk about, oh, is it a PyTorch model? Is it a TensorFlow-like model? Is it a, is it a quantized model? You know, um, we talk about those kinds of nitty-gritty details, and then we talk about, oh, yeah, we can totally take you know, any model, we take it into our SDK, and then we drop it in, you can run it on our embedded device. We have a very primitive way of kind of thinking about how we sell what we're talking about. As someone earlier said in the panel, I, for one, don't care if there's a machine learning model in there or not. I just want the damn sensor to do a job. AI or no AI, I don't care. If it can do a job, then that's what I'm paying the money for, right? So how do you sort of think about it in that layperson sort of perspective, rather than thinking about all the nuances of machine learning technologies that we're trying to sell people? Let me give you an example of this. Sensors. Sensors have been around forever. Right? We're all electrical engineers and computer science engineers. We've been building sensors of one form or another forever. You take DigiKey for an example, right? You go in, what did I punch in here? I punched in temperature sensor. Right? That's what's in the white box, in the search box. And what do you see? You have a whole list of different kinds of questions or questions or choices you can make about the sensor. Right? You have different manufacturers on the first row. Then you have um, different sorts of series within them. Then you have different sensor types. Then you have different temperatures under which these sensors work. They have different interfaces that you can pick from, right? the same sensor. The point is, this is sort of a standard way of how we engineer things. We don't try and build bespoke system. I don't come to you and say, I've got like this really clever little sensor that can do all this stuff, and I'm going to integrate it deeply into your ecosystem in this hyper-particular way. That doesn't make sense. The way we have actually created the world around us is by having standardized sort of mechanisms by which we communicate. And we say, I give you a sensor that does a particular job, and it does damn well, and it's got certain characteristics under which it'll work. It'll work in a really cold temperature region, or it will not work, right? We have really good data sheets. We make all of this transparent. This means that an end consumer who's looking at a machine learning sensor, like a person detector, is able to effectively think about just how to kind of encapsulate whether there's a person or not, not think about you know, what, the, what these neural network models are and so forth. And of course, just talking about the temperature sensor, there's no one temperature sensor. The whole industry has got a whole rich array of different kinds of temperature sensors you can look at, right? They, there's this really rich heterogeneity aspect there. That's important because different people have different needs, which means that if I want to build a person sensor, I cannot just say there's only one type, right? I'd have to think about what the different operating conditions are going to be and then be able to provide those different types of machine learning sensors for that exact, like a temperature sensor, I'll provide a person sensor. So in the world in which like, you know, we should be thinking about is, today when I want to have like, a smart sensor, I tend to think about, OK, which model zoo am I going for? Oh, which data set do I have to get? Oh, is that data set actually representative of the thing? I, have to, I start asking all these nitty gritty ABC questions, which I really don't care about, because at the end of the day, I'm trying to build or trying to operate at a higher level. So the point is that like, you should be able to think about in, like, in three years or five years, what you should really be doing is, you go to DigiKey, or you go to Amazon, Alibaba, pick your favorite store. You punch in the exact AI sensor that you really want, right? And you'll get a whole slew of different variants, right? For either person detection, gaze detection, like whatever you want to do, right? There'll be a whole bunch of different things, different use cases, different sensors we're going to have. And that's the level at which we should be thinking about. Of course, this introduces a whole set of new issues that I'll talk about, but the idea is that it should not be where we are today, which is like deploying models and thinking about which embedded device and thinking about, oh, this only has 256 kilobytes of RAM. Oh, that has only 512, you know, 512 kilobytes of flash or one megabyte of flash. That's the way we think about things today, which I think is very rudimentary. The end consumer is getting overwhelmed with details that they don't really care about in reality. Instead, they should be thinking about this at a high level. OK, so let's assume for a second you run with me on that punchline that, OK, we should be thinking about things at a high level. Then you get into the notion that these sensors should inherently be not model-centric, which is what we tend to do today. Rather, they should be fundamentally data-centric based designs. Right? So for example, you, know, you look at any kind of sensor you're talking about here, right? um, lots of different sensors. You know, These are just examples. All of these sensors, when you look at their operational characteristics, they're data, right? They take in data. That's what they're doing. Some sort of analog data comes in. They either digitize it or put out another analog signal. But fundamentally, they're just processing data. That's what they're trying to get to, right? So then we should really be thinking about what are the unique issues that arise with sensors and their data processing elements. You look at microphones, they tend to have issues around sampling rates, echo cancellation, noise reductions, and so forth. 
cameras, same thing, field of views, demoization, white balancing, all of these. The, the fundamental unit block, which is actually doing the data injection, has got certain key data attributes or data characteristics or data problems that you've got to deal with. Then accelerometers, same thing, right? They tend to bias and all this. So what this means is that you have to look at how you think about the model design throughout the entire flow from the start where you're trying to actually you know, collect the corresponding data to be able to do, build a machine learning model that works on that particular sensor. You have to have a very data-centric sort of a point of view and understand how that sensor's data characteristics change over its lifetime, or really just do lifetime-aware design. Right? But I don't really think that that's what we tend to do today. We tend to think about like, oh, I've got this kind of like cool little neural network model. The next thing is like thinking about how we actually, let's assume now we've kind of built this, built this and we understand that it's a data-centric sort of a paradigm. Then how do we integrate the system into the rest of the ecosystem so that the interfaces are nice and clean? So think about it, right? You build a sensor today, even before I show you that. You, you get a sensor today, okay? So let's say we're doing person detector again. I get a person detector model, I deploy it on an embedded device, and then, of course, you know, how I communicate that information to the external world as to whether I saw a per person or not is highly dependent upon that particular embedded device. There's no standard protocol by which a person sensor is going to work. We can say a standard interface is going to be one for a person, zero for no person, and here's the byte format in which the data is going to come out, right? You can think of it as an I square C or SPI, but then you still need to think about what those interfaces are. And today, when we're building these sensors, we don't have standard interfaces, and this is going to cause a mass ecosystem deployment level issue. Why? Because you cannot just take a sensor that one person has built on their embedded device. You cannot just hot swap it out with another device. Jesus Christ, that's the worst way to do engineering. Where today, if I sell you something, then I'm so embedded into that particular interface that I can't just swap it out. You give me an LED, what do I do? It's got two pins, an anode and a cathode. I don't care what LED you build, you've got an anode and a cathode, otherwise it does not pretty much look like an LED to, to the average person, right? The characteristics of the sensor, yeah, of course they're different. Depends on the manufacturing materials that have been used. But I can be guaranteed that it's gonna light up if I have light flowing, you know, if I have a resistor and I've hooked it up the right way, right? In the right sense of a diode. That simplifies the way I think about, you know, how I, I deploy that, right? And that's what we're really lacking today so we need to establish some sort of standard mechanism. I don't care if it's an I square C or SPI by which we agree on, but the data format that also comes out of that interface needs to be consistent. For example, if it's, let's say it's a person detector, right? You've got some small little thing, it's a person sensor, it's gonna have to dump out some data. Let's say it says, oh, I found a person. Yes, it's one or zero, but now I might need to know where exactly in the image I am, right? So okay, there's some X, Y, coordinates in the image that I just need to put out. It seems fairly simple, but there's no standard for this in the public, side, you know, public domain. I have to understand the particular sensor and then build the interfaces for it. It's not rocket science, but it really makes the deployment aspects hard. So we, need, we basically just need to come up with new schemas, right, that we can all agree upon and say, okay, for this type of a sensor, I can agree that this is the interface and this is the coding format that I will have, so that today, I might be building a sensor. You might say, you know what? That's a crappy person sensor BJ's got. I've got a far better neural network model. It's got my IP, and I've got a really low power version of it. All you gotta do is hot swap it out. You can't do that today with any of the ML sensors that we have today. And of course, you know, talking about data privacy and so forth, I think you know, these are mechanisms that we just have to have in the hardware. You can do logical separation of this. You can do trusted zones and so forth. But I think we have to agree about how we choose to deploy ML models, so if we can effectively communicate to the average end user about how their code, effectively the application code, is protected from us trying to add you know, the ML sauce in there. Now this one I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on, which is ML sensors must be transparent, indicating in a publicly and freely accessible MR sensor data sheet. How many of you know what's a data sheet? Yeah, exactly, we're engineers. We all know what a data sheet is for any device. Why do, we have a device, why do we have a data sheet? It's to be able to scale the building of those devices, right? Let's take the diode example. A node and a cathode, I know that. It's got standard interfaces, okay. However, if I look at the IB characteristics, right, and how bright it's gonna get, ah, that's where your premiums come in, even for a very simple LED, because it depends on the materials. But that's communicated very clearly to me 
through a chart, through a standard way of measuring the, uh, you know, what the brightness, the luminosity of the, the LED is going to be. ML models make the whole way of building a sensor today far more sophisticated and complicated. You take an ML sensor that I'm talking about, right, on the left-hand side. You can say, I have a person sensor, which I've been talking about. What does that really mean? A lot of questions around this, right? The most obvious one that the panel, for instance, talked about was, oh, there might be biases in the data. Okay. That already tells me that I can have a person sensor, I can have a very clean interface that all of us have agreed to that we can do plug and play with, but I still need to understand how the damn sensor is going to work if I take it to one side of the world versus the other side of the world, right? Skin tones might be radically different. How do you quantitatively capture that? Not talk about qualitatively. We've all been talking qualitatively forever, people, for about a decade about biases. We yet haven't made engineering level dent in quantitatively assessing these things. And we need to be able to do that. And that's where the certification aspects really kick in. We need to have a data sheet that we all agree upon as we're trying to build these tiny ML sensors. Here's a hypothetical data sheet. I'm not saying this is the holy grail. This is a vision that we have. It's got a bunch of different components on it. And I'll walk you through you know, some of the key ones that are unique as they pertain to ML coming on board into this sensor ecosystem. There are going to be some usual ones, like the top left one, description, feature, what do you use it for, and so forth, which, like any other data sheet, you know, does the same thing. You have a diagram and a form factor, which kind of tells you, OK, I've got these pins. You know, here's the protocol. You know, here's the input voltage, output voltage, the standard stuff to make the embedded aspect of that system work. And communication interfaces and so forth. But there are a whole bunch of like new ones that are actually there, that are actually critical, that I'm going to talk about in the sense of the person detection module, for instance. The first one is the fact that now, when you have the sensors that are actually running AI on them, you've got a critical issue where you've got a certain model. Your model and my model are not going to be the same just because you and I say it's the person sensor. This becomes critical because now I have to understand what the characteristics of the model are going to be. So you obviously you have things like model cards and so forth that the community has been working on. But in the sensor regime, I need to understand, for instance, what the accuracy characteristics are going to be for that particular network on that particular sensor. Right? We haven't defined exactly what that is going to be as a community yet. Right? What should a particular sensor report? A gaze sensor might be doing different. A keyword spotting sensor might be doing something different. Right? But we need to collectively think about what that needs to be. <clears throat> Another one is about the data set aspect, which came up earlier in the panel. I need to know, when I'm getting that sensor, what the data set was. The big elephant in the room is obviously data, right? as Alessandro was pointing out. But we need to understand, are they key sets of data? Everybody's talking about having large public data sets. I would say that's not going to happen. You are not going to convince me right, to give my training data. You are out of your mind if you think I'm going to do that. I will agree to one thing, though. I will agree to a test data set. Test data is what ultimately determines how good a model really is or how crappy it is. Not necessarily the training data. If you kind of think about it from a practical adoption standpoint, it's the test data set. We need to have some way of kind of you know, assessing you know, what those data sets are going to be, right? So that someone has to say, hey, here's a golden set of test data set for a camera sensor that's doing a security protocol, for instance. Right? So that, because that, that particular test data in the, for that uh, camera sensor for security might have implications like, does this work well at nighttime? Or does it only work well in daytime? You can convince me to give you a little bit of my data because I know where I am targeting my smart camera. So if I care about nighttime scenarios or some quirky things, I'm likely to say, yeah, yeah, you should really be testing for this scenario. So something like that as a community, as a standard for an industry, we can create. And that has to be reported in you know, the data nutrition label, right? Very much like the way we look at nutrition labels on our food products to understand if they're good for us or not. And of course, the standard IoT security labels, right, which talk about like, you know, disclosing what, what sensors do they actually have, what sensors, um, you know, because not all sensors are physically visible to the average consumer, so you want to make that very transparent when you're building the sensor. Another one that I think is really interesting is we need systematic methodologies to evaluate the sensors under realistic testing conditions. So here, for example, I'm showing you on the x-axis is the distance, right, just totally made up data on x-axis is distance. Y-axis is the false positive rate for the left, right? Remember, this is the person sensor module. What I'm trying to say is that when you're putting the sensor into production, 
it's not going to operate under the ideal conditions, right? You cannot say, stand exactly three meters from where the camera is, and I'll guarantee you my device is going to work perfectly. No, the real world is kind of noisy and messy, right? And that's where you're trying to deploy it. But that means that someone has to be testing those sensors in those realistic conditions. You know, for example, I was recently buying a TV. There are standard tests to understand how well a TV does in certain bright rooms or dark rooms and so forth. I use those things to determine which TV to buy for my really bright room. And in that similar vein, we need to have a standard set of tests that are developed for the machine learning sensor. We might not be able to do this for everything, but I think we need to have some basic mechanisms in place, right? And no one's really systematically thought about what this means yet. And of course, there's probably got to be compliance things, right? Someone, not the person who's developing the sensor and saying, oh, check out my sensor, check out my, you know, my software development kits and all that stuff. Those are not the people. I would not trust those people because they've got something in their head. What I really want is some third party sort of association that's actually determining whether the sensor is actually meeting the specs that they're saying it meets to. Now, this could be in terms of the data set characteristic. It could be in terms of the model's performance characteristics. By performance, I mean accuracy as well as performance characteristics. Right? Someone has to be doing this. Today, we don't have anyone doing this kind of stuff. Right? It's all bespoke at best. One of my favorite things. If we're all on board with the idea that, look, this is going to be super awesome, we're going to solve all these problems, at least the way I've kind of laid them out, I think if we solve all of them, that's awesome. I think we will really enable TinyML deployments because there's an industry standard and so forth, which we all know how to build products out of. And then I guarantee you one thing we'll do. We'll create the new internet of trash. Think of plastic bags. Plastic bags are awesome, right? What did we do? We created a planetary scale mess for us. But at the same time, they were awesome. Back in the day when we were building them, we were wickedly excited about them. We were like, oh, they're cheap. I can use them for anything. Look at this amazing little thing. And so what did we do? We made tons and tons of them, not asking downstream what the implications of building those little devices are, right? The devices here being the bags. TinyML, if we manage to convince the world that this is incredibly powerful and we're going to put this everywhere, we're going to put this in smart devices, you're going to put this in your laptops because it's going to do some sort of intelligent face recognition or just knowing if, yeah whether it's on your lap or on the table, all kinds of stuff we're going to do with them, right? And as I said, the students, the next generation are probably ones who are really going to come up with those killer use cases. Long story short, we're going to use them like crazy. Now, this implies that we have to think not only about the energy use case of what, it, you know, what a tiny ML device is. Often when we talk about tiny ML, we tend to talk about, oh, it's ultra low power, it's less than 100 milliwatts, or it's like only you know, a few microwatts and so forth. That's not the real problem. How often do any one of us actually think about what energy it actually took to build the damn thing? Because that's where the real problem is, right? So we talk about lots of applications, especially in SDG and so forth. You know, tiny amount can be applied. So we're all very excited about designing them, deploying them, and you know, trying to figure out how to maintain them in the ecosystem. But as I was saying, we got to manufacture these devices, and that takes a substantial amount of energy Right? And there are carbon emissions and so forth involved with this. And then, of course, logistical costs and so forth. And you know, when the device is running, there's some amount of energy consumption, but that's usually minimal. Right? This is unlike servers. Um, and of course, at the end of the life, you know, these devices, what are they probably going to last for like in three years, maybe five years, or whatnot? But I guarantee you they're actually designed to last much, much longer just from a build, sort of build perspective. They're not lifetime-aware designs. Lifetime-aware design means if I'm going to you know, measure the, whether an Apple is really good or not, then when the Apple is pretty much gone bad, this device needs to, bio, needs to be biodegradable. It needs to decompose. We're not anywhere close to building those kinds of devices, right? The device will continue to last for a long time. So it's basically e-waste, junk, like plastic. We're going to collect it in the seas. So we need to really think about the longer-term picture of like, the sustainability aspect of like, building you know, potentially millions of these devices, billions of these devices, and how do we sort of put the whole ecosystem into practice? Long story short, a lot of numbers on this, but we did basically you know, looked at some you know, existing microcontroller data, right? And you effectively find, unsurprisingly, the last row, the production energy consumption, which is the fabrication costs that are associated as always with any system, really dominate. Especially as you go into the smaller scale devices, that's usually the thing that ends up dominating. And then you've got to worry about not just climate aspects. You know, as you know, we're dealing with silicon substrates and those kinds of things. They are highly notorious in terms of chemical, you know, chemical, um, um, chemically being unsafe, right? So there's a lot of water-related water issues that are associated with it. 
So we got to kind of understand, you know, if we're building these devices, what is the impact that we have? And that's what this analysis is really showing. It's trying to break down and show that, well, is TinyML really as kosher as we think it is, right? It's all positive. That's what we like to talk about. But there's some implications. Last chart with a lot of data. This chart, I, watch, I really want you to just focus on is the rightmost box. If you look at the legend, there's other product use, end of life. There's the training cost. There's the processing, which is the MCU, the memory, which is usually what we talk about. And then there's the physical casing, the uh, PCB and so forth, the transport transportation, the sensing module, and, ah, and the power supply. What the stack plot is actually showing right, is where most of the total life cycle carbon emissions come from. It's not the MCU device, right? It's the fact that you still have to power this thing that's a problem. We're nowhere close with energy harvesting technologies to support tiny ML capabilities yet, right? And all the, the other components actually add up. So the processing that we often talk about, oh, I've got this cute little Mickey Mouse model that can do the amazing things, is really the least of the problems when you take a step back and look at the bigger ecosystem. And if we're not careful about it, we will create the internet of trash. And last but not least, what I want to talk about is sort of like how do we kind of build a community around this. What I've talked about has kind of raised a lot of issues, and a lot of these issues have come about with like deep retrospective kind of thinking about what are we doing with the technology, what are some of the problems, and so forth. And so ultimately, you know, we have to try and address this, right? So I don't have the perfect answer here. The reason I'm kind of partly cribbing about it, as much as even I'm excited about, it, is so that hopefully we'll collectively say yes, some of these questions at least make sense, and we, who want to see TinyML succeed, will get together to help solve these problems. So what we've been trying to do is just kind of build a storyline around this. You know, we have our website where you can go check out the white paper we wrote, which, is, which goes into a lot of detail about some of the things that I've talked about. Um, then we talk about you know, the need to focus on interfaces, standards, and also the ethics aspects of this, which are some, things, some of the things that I alluded to. Um, and yeah, one of the things that we're doing right now is like we've actually, we're working with the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, which if you don't know, is a renowned for actually helping drive technology change along with policy decision making, which obviously, you know, a place like Harvard is, we're fortunate to have a strong mixture of both of those. And so what we're trying to do is bring people together to try and address what the standards and what not need to be, what are the best ethical practices as we try and build these systems and try and put them out. Remember, I told you, we wanted to do something really good for sustainability at Harvard, and we wanted to put small little machine learning sensor cameras that we had built in lab, right? They weren't not even things we bought. We were building them in lab, conscious about how we have to deploy them carefully in the dorms. And we, it's been months, and we still can't get any legal approvals to put them in, right? So I think, so therefore, this led into this whole discussion at Harvard about like how do we sort of enable this instrumentation, because we have to instrument the labs in order to be able to study them, right? So um, at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, there are lots of people who have a lot of experience in policy and so forth that are helping us kind of answer some of these questions. We've just gotten it approved, and we'll actually be running the event, I believe, in August, uh, where we'll be flying in people from all around the world who are experts in different topics to try and understand how we can address these issues. Um, and if you're interested, I'm... Um, I'll point you to the ML Sensors white paper and this uh, New Europe's paper that we're writing, which actually talks about the data sheet. We're actually, we've built a variety of different, these machine learning sensors that are fully integrated and whatnot. We've built a whole bunch of them in my lab, um, thanks to the awesome students. And then we're trying to build the corresponding full-on data sheets as an example of what the industry could look like. I'm not saying I have the perfect answer. All I'm trying to give is some food for thought as to how we should be thinking about building this next generation, this sensor 2.0 sort of a paradigm that we're going into. And with that said, I'm happy to take questions, but with a little side note that I still want to give you a tiny ML education update. So uh, I'll let the organizers decide if I should finish that or whether I should answer questions. Hi, Vijay. Actually, great presentations, and I'm glad you're bringing more reality into this community now after several years going after models and CNNs <laughs> and those kind of things. And I would say that MLPerf and Google are partially to blame for this because Google forced people to use big models, uh, TensorFlow Lite, mobile nets, and so on, and then MLPerf started doing benchmarking using these models, right? That was kind of a scalabration. But now we are back to this point, and the two questions I have are, um, uh, and by the way, kind of at Qualcomm, we follow this data-centric application-specific approach for many, many years. Yeah. So we're not distracted by, by all these things. So the two questions, one is, uh, 
on the golden data sets, uh, I, I'm going to challenge you if such thing is possible. For example, you take a people detector, person detector. So I think your data set may depend, either you have your sensor on the table, on the ceiling, on the floor, what angle, what environment, if it's going to be infrared or not infrared, there are all kind of this application customer specific things. How would you think about kind of a golden data set, uh, data set when you have some kind of level of customization? So you have customization and the, that's kind of a dilemma in, in, in my opinion. I think that, that's a very good question. And this is why I'm saying like, I think the secret sauce about who, who's able to build a good ML sensor or not is really gonna come down to how they do their training data set. Right? So I would still say yes, that's built on customer relationships and figuring out what that training data. I don't think it's going to be possible to create, why would I want to put out my training data set in the world if it's going to enable everybody else? Because building the hardware widget is not really the most complicated thing today, right? So that's why I keep saying that what we need, though, as a community is a shared test data set, right? Someone, some, something like Tanyama Foundation or so forth puts out a test data set that says, on this test data set that the entire community agrees upon, this is how this sensor that's been built for this particular task performs. That sets some sort of a common language where we can all say, okay, uh, now I can actually compare which sensor I should buy. And I, I think like the models, I think this is the next evolution yeah. of ML perf, right? Yeah, I think fundamentally I agree with this. It just, um, it depends like different customers they got to have different type of uh, requirements for the test data set, right? That's, You're that's spot on. I think this, that's very true. This actually happens when you look at seat belts, right? Even in like car safety, like these things have happened before where people have different sort of requirements, and, but there's still a minimum sort of set of standards and you can then start grading at which level you can actually compete at. And that's where I think like if we look at how people have done some of this testing before, we might be able to learn from prior practices and apply them here. Yeah. And my second question is on this data centric approach. You and I spoke about this when we had dinner a few months back. Right now, MLPerf is model centric and you were thinking about kind of transitioning into more data centric approach. Do you have any update on this to this community? Yeah, so actually I believe the announcement around MLPerf is basically a set of standard neural network models that all the you know, silicon vendors by and large and you know, software people agree, okay, are representative models that if we benchmark them, we can understand the performance. In data, we don't have anything like that. Simple question, I asked you to do a code review today, you'd be like, oh yeah, I can do a diff on that. I'll be like, give me a data review today for two data sets. Give me a technical way, a quantitative way of doing it. We don't have tools. We don't have a, a data diff tool, right? Um, so what we have been building at, um, at ML Commons has been like these um, tooling and challenges that will allow us to build new algorithms that will allow us to compare data, improve the algorithms in the open source community and so forth. And that announcement should actually be coming out next month. Uh, I don't want to take the thunder of MLC on this, but yes. Um, so there's a whole new, whole new set of challenges we're releasing um, that hopefully will lead to new algorithms that are in the open ecosystem. Chris, yeah. The idea of modularity of ML sensors is, of course, extremely attractive. You'd love to live in a world in which you have a small amount of input, some interesting model, and you get a one or a zero out of it. In the real world, you often run into subsystems that have much fatter inputs and outputs and therefore much more complex behavior that yeah. you're never going to reduce to a one-page data card. Yeah. What do you find in practice is the trade-off you face between trying to make something simple enough that people say, yes, I think I understand what this thing does, and the reality that some problems can only be solved with very complex, hard to characterize uh, behavioral specifications. How do you deal with the complex behaviors that some models necessarily have? Yeah, so I, I don't think that we, we will end up with a situation where, okay, this is one size fits all. I mean, that's a one-on-one, right? Like, that's just a dumb way of doing engineering, right? Like, yeah. there's some cases where I think, like, once we reach a certain volume, we say, like, yeah, building a bespoke solution for you totally makes sense because I understand the complexities of your system and that effort is totally worth putting in the modifications that we have to do. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I tend to think about it. I'm just trying to get us to the first baby step, which is, like, can we just get to, like, some base agreement? I'm saying, like, 
zero one is an extreme example, but obviously you'd use some established protocols, right? Um, but in terms of communicating it, right? So if I see some object, I just, the data format, there's no, there's no schema that we have agreed upon, which is the most simplest thing, right? And, and existing ecosystems like that we have in the cloud and so forth, we're able to scale ML and get the value out of those systems because they're building on super established standards and so forth, right? Like ML today, you can deploy at scale. Why? You have things like Kubernetes and so forth. Without that kind of stuff, you cannot do ML ops and so forth, right? So they're working on a very rich ecosystem, and we're trying to zip line ahead to that, and that's not going to happen, which, you know, you folks already discussed in the panel. So that's where I'm trying to just kind of think like, okay, what are the next baby steps that we can get to for building even the most simplest, simplest sensors? Thank you. One more quick question, and then we'll let you get your... Hey, VJ, just a very nice presentation. really like the ideas there. Just to be a pain. <laughs> oh, as always. <laughs> yeah. The data set, the test set that you're talking about, it, you know, up until now, we've been dealing with sensors that are, let's say, analog or whatever. They're very linear, and you know that if you've tested them against certain situations, there's no cheating going on, right? In the ML world, it's very different. Right, because if anybody gets hold of that test set, oh. they can train on it, and you will never know. So, <laughs> what do you want to do about it? <laughs> this, this is like uh, my students coming to class and like I'm going to write the exam out, and uh, I've answered it and I've given it to you, right? Like it's the same exact issue, right? I would think that I mean it, that just yeah, we cannot let that happen. But I'm assuming like standards bodies or. Uh, the industry organizations. But how do you detect that somebody hasn't cheated? Yeah. Or that someone has cheated, actually? I do not have an answer to that, but that is a good question, yes, if it has actually been used to, yeah, work backwards and get the model to learn. No, I don't know the answer to that, Adam. Because that's a challenge we have to solve before we can do that, right? Yeah, so. <laughs> I don't think we have to solve that problem. Baby steps, right? I don't think we necessarily have to solve that problem in order to actually you know, un, you know, fully unlock it. And I think we can be working on that problem while we're trying to understand how to get consensus, right? For me, this is just the next iteration of saying, I have a processor, I have a processor, I want to compare. We, we struggled with those things, as simple as they seem today. This is just the next evolution, where now we're saying we've got some bare metal that's got capabilities. Now I've got some software sauce that's sitting on top of it, and that package is suddenly able to do something. How do I compare it for the exact same task? Um, I think like we have to break it down. Otherwise, I just don't see how, how anyone can convince me that it's going to be the old school, you know, pre-ML perf days. It's like, my <laughs> tops are better than your tops, or here, my sensor is better than yours. I'd be like, what? How, how do you quantitatively tell me that? Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, VJ. Why don't we go ahead with your Ed, ed update? And uh, yeah, this will be quick, folks. Promise you I won't hang hang on to you for too long. All right. So this is something very different. I'm as crazy as I am about all the technical stuff. I love what I do on the education and stuff. My first and foremost thing, it's a philosophical thing. I have to set you up in the right context. Um, I have this tenet that, uh, much like we hold big tech institutions like you know, the Googles, the Metas, the Alibabas, the Intels, and also just the way we hold them morally responsible you know, for any sort of technology that they're working on, we expect them to do the right thing. How many of you agree with that general principle that, look, if you're building cutting edge technology that we have a moral responsibility to make sure you deploy it, right? In a very similar way, for me, being an academic, I feel that you know, institutions like Harvard and many other amazing schools that exist, right? We have a responsibility, we faculty have a responsibility to make the material and the educational things that we're working on, all that cutting in stuff, in some way globally accessible to everybody. Because education should not be, you know, it should be something that's equitable, right? Everybody has equal access to it. And that's partly where this whole notion of TinyML EDU kind of sprung up from a couple of years ago, where the mission was really about widening access to machine learning technologies. Now, typically, when you talk about machine learning, it's really not that accessible. Because you know, when you're talking to students about this stuff, it's some kind of software thing. And yes, it does amazing things. But you can't really connect it down to you know, the raw engineering aspects. With TinyML, it's really interesting, right? Because you're, you've got a physical device. You can get it to do simple things like keyword spotting and whatnot. And it's like you know, students see this rich, amazing thing happening in a way that they want it to happen for themselves, right? In other words, you talk to Alexa, Google, and all that, but you speak in English. I've gotten so many videos back from students who have done the TinyML courses that I'll show you, 
where they're talking about they program these devices to do something in their own language. And immediately, like, their brain just connects in such a unique way. But to be able to do that, we have to, you know, support all the educational material that need to go out, and that's what TinyMLEDU is all about, you know. Uh, we've been working with the foundation to enable educational access at a global scale. And here, I want to say that I'm really representing the work of many people. These are some of the leads. Marco Zanaro from ICTP, Brian Plancher, who actually worked on a lot of the TinyML courses that I built when he was at Harvard. He's now a professor at Columbia, Bernard. Um, Marcelo, Jeremy, and then Sean Heimel from Edge Impulse. Uh, Edge Impulse has done a lot of stuff at these in our interactions, um, just spending time helping people learn how, about TinyML. So just want you to know that a lot of people who have done this, this is not me alone. So, and whatever I'm about to show is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we do. So we set up this um, TinyML Open Education Initiative. And really, this is about just kind of curating a wealth of resources that are you know, there. It's like you know, just the way the foundation does an amazing job of bringing all of us here together at the summit annually. And then we get to exchange ideas and learn from each other. We wanted to do something very similar in that spirit to bringing academics together, right? This could be students, teachers, high school students, and so forth. And so this is just a website for all practical purposes where we have a lot of material, and I'll talk a little bit about what we have here. So, you know, one of the first things that we did this was a couple of years ago. Uh, Audrina was a big supporter of this vision that we had. We want to build a machine learning kit. It's not rocket science. It's building a simple little Arduino-based device, but having a fully integrated device, right? That you can run all kinds of crazy examples um, like the keyword spotting. We built this out, then obviously after that, you know, we built a lot of courses which introduced foundations of TinyML and so forth. Edge Impulse had one of their popular courses showing how to use Edge Impulse versus why we're going into the nitty gritty nuts and bolts. And then you know, one of the nice things that we did because we got so much interest in the courses was that like, people were asking that they wanted to have the raw material access, so we opened up a lot of our course materials and ultimately, like, you know, I just kind of looked at the snapshot today. So like, there are like 90,000 students today uh, in, in 177 countries, which practically is the entire world. You know, I was just kind of thinking, how long would it have taken me to do this? My average class at Harvard, typically, when I'm teaching uh, embedded hardware and so forth, is around 40 students. So that would be about 2,000 classes. And even if I was teaching two classes you know, a year, which I don't, I only teach one undergrad classes um, a year, that would still be 1,000 years. So my point is this. With whatever educational materials we have done, I'm excited that one of these 90,000 students is probably going to be the next Bill Gates or the next Elon Musk, crazy, or is going to be like, you know, whoever is your favorite person who helped change the world, Mark Zuckerberg, whoever. And I think like this sort of outreach has been really possible because of people who have been helping put together various kinds of activities. So for instance, one of the most successful activities that we have is a TinyML 4D. When we were making our educational materials globally accessible, just having them available so teachers can look at it, a lot of students were reaching out to me personally, saying like, oh, you know, the kit that you have, which I was very proud of, we were like, oh, Arduino is making it so cheap, you know, the best they can. They're like, we're not even making money on this. Um, they said that it cost them three times to get it in a developing country, just to go through customs and all that. And I had no idea, right? So then what we started doing was like making a specific effort to see how can we facilitate access to these kits um, so that they don't get hung up in customs and the cost of the kits can be really low so that students can actually get the hardware because the online materials they're able to get. From there, we started creating all kinds of different working groups for high schools and like, you know, translating them into different languages and so forth. Now it's like, you know, we constantly run workshops, um, you know, through these channels that we have built. So for example, we have workshops that we have done in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, and we do this continuously. Um, and the community really supports it. You know, we have done this so many times, we know how to organize these things, but we bring together various kinds of people to give, oh, just introduce TinyML from your lens, and what is it? Specifically, though, one of the things that we tend to focus on is scientific aspects of ML, TinyML. It's not just about consumer applications, it's really helping them understand how can TinyML be used in scientific applications. Um, this is just a chart, oh, comes out better there. This is a chart uh, of the latest snapshot that we have uh, about the various places where we have universities and we have teachers who are actually point faculty where we ship kits to them and generally in the order of like 10 to 20 and then you know, they actually are responsible for distributing it to the students and making sure they, they join the activities that we're running from time to time and so forth. This actually started out with just you know, a little bit of focus in South America because we had people who were passionate there at that point. But then since then, as you can see, it's actually scaled out and we get so many requests, it's just more that like, we don't have the bandwidth to do things. 
And now it's kind of very cool. Like these are just some pictures that we have. Uh, we have like even even during COVID, in the bottom right, you'll see people who are still wearing masks. We were doing this over COVID time, which is when we actually built a lot of the material. And now what's really cool, I think this is the best part. Originally, we were all very focused on enabling students, right? Like teaching, that's what we were really focused on, teaching the students, because that's what, you know, I'm typically thinking about. But now what's happened is effectively teachers, you know, we're shifting our focus to teaching the teachers because the teachers have gotten knowledgeable enough to say that, oh, I can actually start teaching this and just supporting them in terms of the material. And now, of course, because the teachers are going out and teaching their own stuff, you see like really awesome, like they understand the technology, the students understand the technology, but then they end up doing these like really interesting deployments of TinyML that really are specific to their regional area. They're not just some general keyword spotting models or something. And that's been the most interesting thing. Like if you look at it, they look, they look at applications of the TinyML that they've learned for their specific local problems. So they've done a lot of different kinds of applications. Um, which has been really rewarding to see. As you can see, it ranges from health applications to wildlife to agriculture and you know, water quality and so forth. Another really interesting thing that we've seen that we're very happy about is the, the students who have actually done this are now effectively writing research papers, which, okay, we can talk about, you know, at what level are these like NeurIPS, ICML, ICLR kind of papers, or are they like, you know, there's still research papers, and I've looked over these, and they're scientific papers, people. You know, we can slice and dice what level they are. But it's interesting because this basically means that students are really, you know, progressing to the next level beyond just learning stuff to actually, you know, trying to pioneer new ideas, right? So these are just some examples I kind of picked out from our list. Uh, another thing that we all have also been doing based on interests that we've gotten more towards the end of last year has been like running the show and tell. So just like those uh, presentations that I kind of popped up, what we do is a show and tell where we actually ask the students to come out they talk about TinyML, they talk about what they did in their project, and they talk about what are the hardships that they had and so forth. Long story short, what we're really trying to do is just support them by giving them a way to kind of showcase some of their work, because otherwise, normally, these people would never have a platform in which to demonstrate what they're actually learning. Right? And of course, there's also you know, a lot of uh, adoption and interest in um, you know, undergrad courses that are actually happening. So some of these from Brazil and Colombia were some of the original ones that started off using some TinyML material that we created. Of course, domestically, yeah, I teach TinyML, and I'll, I kid you not, I'm not making this up because it's my class or something. Every time the course goes up, I usually have about 175 students who want to take that thing, and Harvard's not a big place. I used to be at UT Austin where I would have 400 students in a class, right? So for Harvard, it's a ridiculous size because the class size is typically around 40. Why am I saying this? It's just an incredible amount of interest. And it's not just the computer science students or the EE students who are interested. There are actually students who are interested from like architecture and design and so forth. And it's kind of crazy. And I'm often like, my God, it's like I never thought these people would be interested in it. So the point is, as much as we're all you know, geeking out here at the lowest levels of details, when you look at it from a different world, people are finding a lot of incredible value. This is why I say I think the next big DynML application is going to come from one of the kids. Um, and of course, you know, many schools, in addition to just you know, Harvard, Columbia, NYU, UPenn, um, UPenn has actually put together a phenomenal undergraduate um, full-on embedded machine learning course um, that I think is really nicely done. So there's a lot of academic material that's actually increasingly growing out. I expect in the coming years, embedded machine learning is going to be the, the foray to embedded systems. Um, continuing more on like workshops, now what we're actually doing is, you know, we're raising funds to actually bring people, you know, so far we've just been disseminating the thing and providing Zoom interfaces and scheduling and all kinds of stuff. Now we're actually trying to create venues where we fly people in so we can actually directly interact with the teachers who are actually teaching things in uh, you know, the far out places. The whole reason here is mostly to kind of create a community of teachers who are actually teaching TinyML because they will be able to inspire the next generation. And of course, you know, we've written stuff because the UN folks are actually interested in this, written about like, you know, how TinyML is actually useful for some of the SDG uh, goals, and obviously communicating to the broader industry about you know, how TinyML as a technology is actually a very, very useful educational tool to get students to realize it's not all about computer science and neural network models. Someone's got to build the hardware, right? Because if you know anything about education, everybody wants to do all the CS and ML stuff. No one actually wants to build the hardware that can actually run the stuff. So someday they're going to be like, why is there no widget here to run my stuff? I'm like, yeah, that's because none of you know how to build it. Um, so we're passionate about making sure students actually understand this bigger picture. So last slide, just a call for help. Um, you know, 
We often buy these kits. Uh, some companies are amazing at supporting stuff, um, just in terms of like buying the kits. You know, they're still like 30 to 50 bucks a pop. And continuously, you know, like we're doing a new one in Ghana where we bought like 400 kits that we're going to do with Google support, which we really appreciate. Uh, we need support to teach the teachers. You'd be surprised. Teachers don't want to just learn. People like me, yeah, okay, I'm a little geeky guy, so I'm always like, if I'm going to learn something, I'll do whatever it is to show up. You know, you don't even have to give me free pizza. Um, but in the real world, a lot of teachers actually, they need financial support to come because it's an extra work to actually learn something new. So we've actually had to pay teachers to just be in the classroom to learn something so that they can go back and teach it. So that requires financial support. That requires, you know, locations where we can actually host all of this. So it's just a call for help to try and scale things out because the growth and interest in the space is so much that we're almost kind of capping out because we're all just volunteers. This is not my full-time job. Harvard would be like, what? Where are the research papers? Um, so if folks are interested, please, please feel to uh, reach out to me. Or again, more importantly, there are a lot of people doing this. This is not just me. There are a lot of people who are really excited about it. So if you are interested, please do reach out. This is super important stuff. Almost more important, I would say, than some of the everyday stuff that we all do, because the next generation is, you know, you got to get them when they're young and early. So thank you, folks. And I'll turn it back to you all.